not hard work, but studying is. But I enjoy that too. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've been in a series called Mighty Invincible Love. And I'm going to jump back into that this morning. Um, the first series was just called Mighty, the first in the series, Mighty Invincible Love. It was two weeks ago on the 31st of January. And uh, then this past Wednesday night, I got into part two. And a lot of you weren't here that night, but. If you're interested in staying up on the series, sign up for the CD on the way out today because it was titled Unconditional Acceptance. Amen? It was really good. I asked a question. I baited everybody by asking them the question, can God be disappointed in you? And everyone started to raise their hand, then they stopped. <laughs> it was one of those questions they had to think out. But I read the definition of disappointed from the dictionary when you read it from the dictionary, it becomes pretty obvious that he can't be disappointed with us, especially when he knows what we're going to get into anyway. But anyway, that sermon was about unconditional acceptance. I think it was a very timely word that you need. Uh, you need to be impacted by that to understand what righteousness really is, how powerful it is in your life. Andrew said something this morning, and in the first message from this series, we really touched on it a lot towards the end. We were talking about the difference between loving Jesus and then understanding his love for us. Yeah. And I said this, there's nothing wrong with us saying that we love God and with us loving him. There's nothing wrong with singing about it, talking about it. Uh, but all we're really going to get from our love for him is excitement. But when we get a revelation of his love for us, we get empowerment. Yeah, that's right. yeah. There's a big difference. Yeah, that's good. Excitement doesn't empower you. Amen. Empowerment will not only excite you, but it will transform you. Amen. And it will empower you with the great with the power and the authority to do the greater works that Christ said we were going to do. Amen. Amen. I'm excited right now. Very excited. I think what I feel in my spirit, the next series that I'll transition into. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back just a little and let some of our ministers here in house do some ministering over the next few weeks as well. Uh, because we have some very gifted speakers and, and anointed men and women. I want them to be involved in the sharing the word as well. But I think the next series I'm going to get into is going to have a little bit of more of a kingdom twist on it again. Because the Bible said, defines the kingdom as being righteousness, peace, and joy. Amen. Righteousness, peace, and joy. It's my understanding right now of what God is doing. I kind of have found myself thinking a little bit more like a reformer in the recent years. And I believe on the grand scale, he is restoring our understanding of righteousness first, which is what the grace message has been all about. Amen. And then from that will flow peace and joy. Amen. But I believe that there's another release coming to the body of Christ. We, like we've had the grace message, we're about to get an understanding of peace, Amen. what all that means. Then I believe from that we're going to flow into incredible joy. Amen. Amen. Now, that's all just kingdom. But do you know that when Jesus told the disciples how to pray, he ended that prayer by saying, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And I believe what the planet Earth is going to see once we have kingdom down is power and glory. Amen. So I, he does things in threes. He does. He, I mean, it's a divine pattern in Scripture. It's a divine pattern in you, in your life, and all throughout your body. And I believe that he's restoring that, mes that message of grace and then peace and then joy. That's just all kingdom. Yeah. Then we're going to get into the power being released because we're preaching the kingdom really for the first time effectively in a couple of thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> the body of Christ is going to begin to understand what the kingdom is and understand righteousness, peace, and joy. And it's going to pave the way for, for power to be dem the demonstration of power. Now, I'm not talking about just individually isolated experiences where people are healed, but where you go everywhere healing people, yeah. where your shadow heals people, that kind of stuff. Man. You know what I'm saying? And for glory, and glory is a is a is a bigger thing than just in a. It's it's not a feel good thing. It's a manifested presence of God. It's, it's a very powerful thing. So. That's not the message, but this is kind of a setup for it. This is all part of the grace message right here. So this morning I'm going to be in the same series, but this one is going to be entitled Close Encounters of the God Kind. Close Encounters of the God Kind. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So Father, I thank you this morning for clarity of thought, clarity of speech. 
I know that I'm anointed. You place that there, but I just thank you for clarity of mind, clarity of speech. I thank you, Father, for strength this morning, and I thank you, Lord God, for receptive hearts and minds all through this house, Lord. Thank you that the Grace Center has tremendous capacity to receive your word, to receive it deep into us, Lord God, where it takes root and grows, and the fruit of the Spirit shows in our lives. Thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So in Mighty Invincible Love Part 1, we talked about the Greek having four definitions or understandings of love, right? Mm -hmm. Number one was storge, which is like familiar or family love. It's kind of like the affection we would have for family members. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that we can't always choose family members. Well, we can't choose who our family is. We can choose who our friends are, but you don't, you know, you're born into family. You have family all around you. And I said this uh kind of being cute and passing, if we had a choice <laughs> who our family was, we would, I mean, some of the people in our family, if they weren't family, we wouldn't hang out with them. Amen. 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 Because we just don't have anything com in common with them. The second kind of love was eros, eros love. And it is, it is the erotic, passionate feelings that are involved with love. Uh, the warm, fuzzy feelings even. It's, it's that type of love. I said it's also the type of love that Hollywood glamorizes. It's the type of love that the world falls down and worships because of the glamorization of it. Because we're addicted to that feeling. It feels great when you fall in love. Everybody agree? And you can't think enough about a person. You can't get enough of a person. And you're just constantly in communication, wanting to spend time with one another. It's, that's the eros love. That's the eros aspect of love, okay? And then we talked about, uh, and keep in mind, that's, that's fun, that's passionate, it's awesome, but it comes and goes, okay? Yeah, and over the course of time, it will come and go multiple times from, the different, from your relationships, okay? It will come and go, but uh, there is a love that keeps you committed and it keeps things intact and healthy even when the eros is gone, okay? Yeah. Uh, number three was filio love, and that's like a brotherly love, friendship, common interests. Uh, you know, I've got common interests with you, a brotherly love for you, so I love you, and we are going to share uh, a friendship that will grow over time. That's kind of what filio's love was about. Where we left off was talking about Jesus restoring Peter out on the seashore that day. You remember in John chapter 21, I took him out there restored him. He said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? We got into that. And uh, I'm not going to rehearse much of that this morning for the sake of time, but I said he's doing open heart surgery on Peter because as Peter was out there that day, Jesus said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you uh, agape me more than these? Talking about the other disciples because on the night of the Last Supper, Peter had said, though all these betray you, I never will. Right? So he's at, so, so Jesus is doing an open heart surgery for the sake of Peter. He needs Peter to see what he has in here. He needs him to see that uh, it's not about his love for Jesus, but Jesus' love for him. Okay, so it never was about how much Peter loved the Lord because I, 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 I believe that Peter really was convinced he would never deny the Lord. He really was. He really believed that. Amen. All right, so the other disciple that was hanging out there close by, though, was John. And uh, John wasn't spouting off, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll never deny you, I'll never do any of that. He was just laying his head on Jesus, <laughs> just soaking in the love, basking in the love, okay? And so a filial love is a strong love, but it, it can be broken usually in times of betrayal. Okay, so that's where we left off right there. Jesus was telling Peter, uh, as he restored him, he, he was restoring him, first of all. He was encouraging him, second of all. Third of all, he was preparing him for the ministry that he had called him to. Yeah. When he starts talking about tending my sheep, tending my lambs, feeding my sheep, he's talking about a very specific ministry function that Peter was going to have on his life. So he's restoring him and empowering him and equipping him for ministry, okay? Okay. But Jesus was also telling him, you might have betrayed me, but I didn't forsake you, and I never will. Amen. Amen. Okay, because Jesus wasn't functioning in filial love. He was functioning in the God kind of love, which brings me to number four this morning. If you're taking notes, is the word agape or agape is how we've pronounced it traditionally, so we'll go with agape, okay? 
Agape love is unconditional love. It's the God kind of love. So turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. We'll begin at verse 7 and we'll do some reading of that chapter so I can uh, lay a little bit of foundation to help you understand what the God kind of love is all about. First John chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. For God is love, okay? <clears throat> I actually talked about the first verses 1 through 6 on Wednesday night. So if you weren't here Wednesday night, verses 1 through 6, where he's warning about false prophets and false teachers that have gone out. I really kind of detailed that on Wednesday night, so it's on the CD from Wednesday night. Um, verse 9, I want you to notice a couple of phrases. He's about to say, in this, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So in this, love is manifested towards us or demonstrated to us that God sent his son. In this. So he's saying, in this, in this act, God demonstrated his great love for us by sending his son. Now Jesus even said that, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Okay? So verse 10. In this is love. Now we're about to understand the difference between where Peter was at in his life and where John was at in his. In this is love, not that we loved God, Peter. Amen? <laughs> not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, that's the word agape, if God so agape us, we also ought to agape one another. Okay? No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Amen. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. Amen? Say he, he has. Yes. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Amen. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, which is the Greek word crisis, because as he is, so are we in this world. So... Love is perfected among us in this, that in the day of our crisis moment, we will be so secure in the love of God that we won't be overwhelmed with fear. Amen. In a crisis moment in our life, what's a crisis moment? A doctor's report, amen. Uh, bad news from someone you're in a relationship with, uh, when your children are in trouble, all kinds of stuff. Those are the crisis moments of life. In the crisis moment, it's your, your, when love is perfected among you, in you, amen, then it casts out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. I agree with that to you. Amen. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him, and there it is again, because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. All right, I want you to listen close. I'm going to give you a little bit more definition for agape. Agape love is all about the lover and not the one being loved. Okay, so it's the God kind of love, but agape love is all about the lover and not the one being loved. Okay, in its purest form, it requires no payment or favor in response. Okay? Now, that's hard for some minds to get wrapped around, but it's particularly hard for a religious mind to embrace. Religious thinking has a hard time because a religious mindset, religious thinking wants to do something to earn right standing, do something to earn his love, 
or do something to repay him back. And it can sneak up on you in a subtle way. Have you ever seen some of the subtle things that Christians say? Like they'll share these little cliche phrases. Christ died for you. Won't you live for him? You see where the, where the foundation is kind of in condemnation there? I mean, it's kind of some, some of the things that we put out there we're not really thinking through. Yeah. Amen. Uh, it's not about uh, guilt tripping somebody into living better. Right. But it's about teaching them how much God loved them and how much he paid for them. Man. And there's, he uses ransom wording in all of, through that chapter, words that talk about redemption uh, and, and ransoming and purchasing the propitiation. I'm going to get into that here in just a minute for our sins. So God's love for you and towards you is not altered at all by what you do or what you don't do. Amen. 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 It's not changed or altered whatsoever. You can't earn it. You can't merit his love. His love is there because of who he is, not because of who you are. Amen. Amen. And that's a powerful understanding that the body of Christ really needs uh, to get their mind wrapped around. That means he chooses to love us even when we choose not to love him back. Amen. 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 Yeah. He loves the world, not just the believer. Amen. Not just the believer, not just the Christian, but God so loved the world. Amen. He agape the whole world. Yeah. Everyone in it. Amen. Amen. Even the people that you think are vile and that don't deserve love. The reason you think they don't deserve love is because it's not agape love you're operating in. Uh, uh, you're, you're looking at them thinking, I'm not going to reciprocate. I'm not going to give love to them. They don't deserve it. They haven't done anything to earn my love. What is that? That's, that's filial love. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not agape love. The God kind of love says, I'm going to love you because of who I am, not because of who you are. Amen. That's the God kind of love. So, yeah, but Pastor Mark, we can't do that. We're not God. Excuse me, though. Christ lives in you. God gave us, this chapter said that he loved us so much he gave us his spirit. And put his spirit in us to empower us to do the things that he did. Amen? So you can do it when you begin letting him live his life through you. And that's the key right there is getting the mindset off of the focus that Peter had his mind on. How much I love you and how I'll never deny you and I'll never betray you, though everybody else will. They might all turn from you, but I never will, Lord. Peter didn't even know what was in his own heart. He had no idea until that moment where the words were coming out of his mouth and the rooster crowed in the background. Amen. And then it came crashing down on him that his love had limits. His love was not on the right foundation, but there's a more powerful love that we can operate in. It's the agape kind of love. Amen. Amen. So only a God kind of love can be that way. Um, all of us in here feel like we're failing at different things in our life, at different times in our life. We're messing up constantly, but his love never changes for us. Okay. Amen. Let me ask you a question. How many times over the course of your life, over the course of our lives, have we stayed home from church or not lifted our hands in the worship service or not got into the word that week or not pray for a co-worker when we clearly overheard them saying they were going through something. Okay? All because we've been focusing on our love for him. And because our love for him hasn't measured up at that season in our life or at that time in our life, we perceive a disconnect. So we don't feel qualified or capable of helping anyone else or lifting holy hands or doing the thing. Why is that? Because we have been looking at our love for him, not his love for us. Amen. His love for us never changes. Amen. So we feel Amen. like we've let him down. In our mind, it causes a perceived disconnect to take place between us and God. Okay. Amen. We find ourselves operating in guilt and condemnation and shame. And we're evaluating how we love God or how we didn't love God that week. Amen. And that's kind of the tool in the hands of a religious mindset. Yeah. Okay. Is, is it begins to evaluate how much we loved God or didn't love God that week. So we begin to evaluate ourselves to determine whether we're worthy or whether we're good enough or whether, uh, have you ever, let me tell you if you've ever been, I know everyone here has been, has been guilty of this. We've all done this, okay? But let me just give you some examples. If you've ever had anyone in a prayer line uh, just say, God is going to heal diseases today. If you're here and you need healed, I want you to come up for a prayer. And on the way up, your mind starts thinking about something you did that week. Amen. Does that ever happen to anybody? No. Yeah, see, you know what I'm talking about then. You can relate to what I'm talking about. We measure ourselves up 
to determine whether we deserve his goodness in our life by how we have behaved that week. Yeah. So if you had the kind of week where you binged drink for several days or you fell off and used drugs or you slept with somebody or something like that, I'm not justifying, I'm not saying all that stuff is okay. There's consequences to that stuff. But I'm saying that doesn't change his love for you. It does not change his love for you. But if you don't have an, a revelation of his love for you, if all you're operating on is the power of your love for him, you feel like a failure that week. And you feel like, I can't possibly get healed. I can't possibly. And this is even worse when somebody asks you to pray for someone and give the healing to them. Amen. Then you really start checking yourself. Have I measured up this week? Have I measured up to the point where the anointing can flow through me or not? Amen. Amen. And so we start self-checking and self-examining ourselves to see if he can flow through us, okay? All right, so you need to get a Wednesday night CD as well because I actually stop and do some teaching on that. All right. When we, there's a scripture in the New Testament that I'm just going to kind of pull it out of context to use it here. Uh, we don't feel worthy or qualified to lift up holy hands in prayer without wrath and doubt. When you're into self-examination, self-examination, then we don't feel qualified to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubt. All right, so when I'm secure in his love for me, I have no doubt that he loves me. Man. I have no doubt that he loves me. Man. I have no fear of wrath because I understood or I understand that Jesus took that wrath. on He took all wrath on him, okay, when he became the propitiation for our sins. Wrath is a pretty interesting word, too. I'm not going to get into it this morning, but it warrants a good look at that word. Uh, agape love says that I can choose to love you even if you're my enemy. Amen? Oh, no, nobody amen. wants to say amen. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. Amen. Because this love is a commitment that's not contingent on your behavior or your actions. Okay. So it says, I can choose to even love my enemies. Yeah. Anybody else thought it was interesting that Jesus said you can love your enemies, you can love those who spitefully use you and take advantage of you? Yeah. Anybody else wondering how? <laughs> I mean, what are you talking about, Jesus? Yeah. I don't know how you... Well, this is how he was able to do that. Yeah. It was an agape love that chose to love someone, and it wasn't contingent on their behavior. It was just, I'm going to choose to operate in love, and you can't change that. And I'm telling you, we can all get to that place. That's the place that different men and women in history have gotten to in their lives, where, where even wrongfully accused or, or, or criticized or slandered, and they've risen up and they've said, I'm not going to let you change who I am or how I feel about you, even though you're being racist towards me, Man. or even though you're being hateful to me, I'm not going to come down on that level. Man. I'm going to love you. Yeah. Amen? Man. And some of the greatest men and women in history who've been able to lead revolutions and transformations of societies are people who have accessed a higher love, yeah. a higher power of love. Are they perfect? No. But they understand this one thing, that, that only there are some evils that only love can conquer. Man. Amen? Yeah. Only love can conquer hate. Okay? So Jesus made the choice before the foundations of the world that he was going to wrap himself in flesh. He was going to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Turn over to Colossians chapter 1 with me. Colossians chapter 1. I want to take our time and look at this chapter carefully this morning. Everybody doing okay? Amen. Everybody else hot or is that just me? Thank you. Y'all aren't so bad yourselves either. <laughs> I alley -ooped it. You alley to the hand of Slam Duncan. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. And that's when you know that you've got it, when other people hear about it. <laughs> when other people are hearing about your love for the saints and its word has begun to spread abroad, you know you're getting the concept. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, 
which has come to you as it has also to, in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. I'm telling you, the gospel, the gospel is what transforms lives. Man. The truth, a lot of stuff that we've called the gospel wasn't really gospel. Man. Gospel is good news. That's right. More specifically, it's the good news about what Jesus Christ did to put you in right standing with God again. Yes. That's gospel, amen? So the gospel, you've heard the word of the truth of the gospel which came to you and has also gone into the world and look at it, it's bringing forth fruit. Yes. The gospel's bringing forth fruit. I'm telling you, you sitting under gospel causes fruit in your life. Yes. It causes the fruit of the Spirit to grow in your life, to manifest in your life. Amen. As it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Look at that. Paul was a grace preacher. <laughs> as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who as a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for all of you and, ask, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'm going somewhere with this, but I want you to be patient with me and examine this chapter carefully. I want you to see the buildup. Paul was a masterful teacher. Man. He really was. I want you to see the buildup here. He's talking about the gospel producing fruit because of your understanding of the grace of God. And he says, Epaphras came and told us all about you, how you operate in the love of God, the love of the Spirit. And he says, since that day, from that day to now, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you be filled with all of the knowledge of God. Okay, so he's not necessarily praying for back aches, head aches, leg aches, diseases to be cured, such, such as that, right? What he's praying, same as in Ephesians chapter 1, an apostolic prayer is that is for revelation, for understanding, and for wisdom of everything that you possess on the inside of you. Amen? Amen. That's an apostolic prayer. <clears throat> that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. Tell your neighbor every good work. Every good work. Because I'm going to talk about good work in just a moment, okay? That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. It's powerful stuff. Amen. Amen. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Yes. Okay, so there is there he is talking. He begins to talk about the propitiation for our sins. Him redeeming us through his blood. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness of sins came through the blood of Jesus Christ. He, in verse 15, Jesus, is the invisible is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now I'm going to skip over that. I really would like to talk about that. But verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him... To reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your own mind by wicked works. Okay, so we talk about good works and there's wicked works. Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. The King James says unreprovable. Unreprovable in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
So Paul is saying right there, I'm a grace preacher, and I'm proud of it. Amen. Amen. Uh, look at verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them. To who? The saints. To the saints God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. Reconciliation was a theme that was woven all through that chapter right there, okay? We were reconciled to right standing with God, the Father, through Jesus Christ. Man. Righteousness is a gift so that we've been empowered. We were given the gift of righteousness so that we could be empowered to live the life we were always meant to live. Man. The life we were always meant to live is the life of Christ, the God life. Amen? Man. Okay, so remember the Apostle Paul said back up there, he said, you once were alienated from God in your minds. Yes. <laughs> I want you to get that, okay? The, the perceived disconnect in what you were alienated from God, but it was in your mind, okay? So all the way back to Eden's garden, when Adam and Eve fell, they sensed a disconnect uh, and a separation had taken place. They fell in their minds. They were no longer able to conceive the will of God, conceive the, 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 the purpose of God for their lives, okay? Okay. So they, when they perceived that disconnect had taken place or, or separation, they were consumed with guilt and shame and condemnation. It caused them to feel in their mind they became alienated from God, okay? Man. So had a separation taken place? Yes, but only in the mind of man and only from man to God, okay? We could no longer think like him in the earth. And if we can't think like him in the earth, then we could never talk like him. We could never move around and function like him if we're incapable of thinking like him. So everything that Christ did, I'll, I'll, I'll get to this, but everything that he did, the blood that he shed was all to purge our conscience from dead works. It was to, uh, it was to do a mind renewal process in our lives. And that's why in several places, all of the letters, uh, all of the, the letters to the churches, he says, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. He, he's dealing with this thing in the mind. The alienation that had taken place in our mind. Okay. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 11. What Jesus did on the cross was he shed his blood to purge our conscience from dead works to empower us to serve the living God. Now, I'm still talking about love. I'm still talking about the agape love of God for his creation. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. We'll read verse 2 through 15. 11 through 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more, say more, more. shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Let me read through it real quick in the Message Bible, just because I want it to come alive to you in, in modern language. But when the Messiah arrived, high priest of the superior things of the new covenant, he bypassed the old tent, all its trappings in this created world, and he went straight into heaven's tent, the true holy place, once and for all. He also bypassed the sacrifices consisting of goat and calf blood, instead using his own blood as the price to set us free once for all. If that animal blood and the other rituals of purification were effective in cleaning up certain matters of our religion and behavior, think how much more the blood of Christ cleans up our whole lives inside and out. Through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifices 
sacrifice freeing us from all those dead end efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God. Man. So what he was freeing us from was all of our dead end efforts to make ourselves right with God. <clears throat> you know, the first, the, the Mosaic covenant that was given on Mount Sinai, it had a purpose. God gave them what they asked for. They, they chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They immediately suffered the consequences. They fell in their minds and perceived a disconnect. They were aware. They were ashamed. They were guilty. They felt the guilt. They thought of it. They could feel it in their mind. They lost their ability to reason like God, to think like God. Okay? So when you fast forward to, to Mount Sinai, when the law was given... It was basically God telling them, I'm going to give you what you've asked me for. If you want to earn your righteousness, here's how. This is the only way that you, in your own effort, can bring yourselves into right standing with me. And he gives them 613 commandments and says, you have to follow every one of them to the T in order to do this in your own strength and in your own power. And you know that they said... Go ahead, give it to us, and it will be our doing when we do it. That's what they said. Man. Wrong answer. They never were able to keep their covenant with God. Right. Never. Right. But the whole purpose of him giving it to them was to prove to them that you can't do this on your own. You cannot. It's impossible. You're going to have to settle in to my plan for your life and let me take you back to the tree of life again. Amen. Amen. Because it's the only way that you can think like me and function like me and move like me and be in my image and in my likeness in the earth. Amen? Amen. So how did he empower us to serve the living God? By cleansing our conscience from dead works. Amen. All right? How did he cleanse our conscience from dead works? By shedding his blood. Amen. What are dead works? Hebrews chapter 6 says this, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection. Perfection, right, by the way, there's not a verb, it's a noun. It's talking about the man, Jesus, is what it's talking about. When you begin to study that out, we think, well, let us go on into perfection. That means we have to work at becoming perfect, but that's not what that word means. It's, it's a person that he's talking about when he says perfection. He's talking about coming on into Christ, Okay. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. It's a noun in the original language is what I'm saying, by the way. Or of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. But right up there, he says, not laying again the foundation, the foundation of the gospel, period, is repentance from dead works. Now, we, the way that we sometimes preach the gospel is we want people to repent from their sins. <laughs> we want people to turn and repent from all of the wrong that they've done. But repentance is, I mean, Jesus said, John the Baptist said it, Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. But the Greek word for repent is metanoia, and it means change how you think. That's right. It does not mean cast aside all the wrong you've ever done. It means change how you think up here about your right standing with God. So that's repentance. So he, so the foundation for the gospel is repentance from dead works. It's repenting and turning from the lifestyle of trying to do to be. Amen. And just getting established in who you be, who you are. Amen. Because right doing will flow from right being. That's right. But right being will never flow from right doing. Yeah, right. You can keep trying to do everything right and do everything good and avoid everything wrong, but you'll never become righteous in those efforts. Right. You'll become frustrated is what you'll become. You'll become confused and bitter and frustrated because you will keep falling into the same stuff over and over again. As bad as you don't want to. And even at some point in your life, the things that we continue to run back to become revolting to us, but yet we still keep going back to them. Yeah. Why? Because we are hopelessly addicted to them because of the empowerment of us. Think it's, it's that thinking, that mindset in our lives of we have to do, we have to work, we have to labor to bring ourselves into right standing with God. But the very first thing you've got to do when you come to Christ is repent of that thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he said the elementary principles 
the foundation of repentance from dead works. That's the very bottom layer of true Christianity. Amen. True Christianity. Repentance from dead works. I can't do this on my own, God. So I can only believe in what you did through your son on the cross. Amen. Amen. So dead works are anything you're trying to do to gain right standing with God. Amen. That's dead works. Yes. Anything you're trying to do to gain right standing with God. The irony is this. Well, let me tell you what good works are. Good works are any activity that is flowing from your right standing with God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The irony is sometimes it's the same thing. It's the same works. <laughs> Dead works are what we try to do to gain right standing with God. Good works are what flow from our lives as a result of our right standing with God. But sometimes they're the same works. They're the same activity. Do I need to break it down a little deeper? <laughs> Reading your Bible, for instance. Praying so many hours a day. Going to so many church services a week. I don't do any of those things to get right with God. I do them because I am right with God. And there's something in my spirit that keeps drawing me back to the word. Because I realize it's his truth. It's his word. There's something that draws me to prayer. I want to be in his presence. Not so that I can convince him or connive him to do something for me. But I want to be in his presence because I've been transformed by his love for me. And it makes me love him in return. But it makes me want to be with him. It makes me want to abide with him. Okay? So that's the difference. It's, 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 it's really about the thinking. Okay? Dead works flow through an unrenewed mind. An unrenewed mind still sitting on the throne in the realm of sense. Okay? So the river that flows out of the earth realm and the tree, that river flows out of the earth realm. The tree grown by its banks is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? Uh, so in contrast, uh, the individual that's consumed with what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong, they can never experience the true life of Christ in their life. Yeah. They're just consumed with what they're doing right and wrong. But good works flow from a renewed mind. Yes. Good works flow from a renewed mind that is focused on redeemed thinking. Yes. And it flows from our position, which is seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Okay? The river flows from the throne of God, and the tree of life is growing on both sides of it, Revelation tells us. Amen? There's no thought of what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong and how it can keep me from getting to God, but my mind is filled with what Christ did right on my behalf. Amen? Amen. To bring me into right standing with the Father, because as He is, so am I in this world. Amen? Amen. All right, let's talk about the propitiation that He paid for our sins. Matthew chapter 27. <laughs> What he did, the way that he accomplished this, the way that he demonstrated the love of the Father for us was that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, right? Yeah. That was his demonstration. And then 1 John chapter 4 says, in this, in this is love that God sent his son. Amen. In this is the love of the Father that God sent his son. So I'm going to talk now about how he literally did it on the cross, what he did for us. I want you to keep your mind focused on the theme of love. It's, it's agape love that I'm talking about. It's how much the Father loved you and never turned his back on you and never forsook you, okay? Amen. So Jesus shed his blood, blood for us at the place of the skull. Matthew 27, verse 33. <clears throat> and when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, in the original language, well, in Latin, in the Latin, it's, Calvarius, or Cal, which is where we get the word Calvary. In the Aramaic, it's Golgotha. In the Greek, it's cranium, where we get the word cranial or cranium. Okay, so it all has to do with the head. I want to just tell you three things here. This is irrelevant kind of to the message. It's just an interesting highlight for you. Uh, Golgotha was on, was on a cliff that possibly was shaped like a skull. Okay? It's one of the reasons why they might have called it Golgotha, because it sat on a cliff... And I've seen pictures before what looks like a skull on the face of a cliff. But, number two, it was littered with the skulls of those who had been crucified and executed on that hill before. Okay? Number three, it's understood in Jewish history that that was the place where the skull of Adam was buried. In Jewish history. It's understood. So if you believe that, and I like to study all of that. Some of it I can't swallow all of it. Can't get my mind wrapped around all of it. But I find that thought interesting. 
I really, that intrigues me that at the skull of Adam was buried on that hill. It makes sense that the Savior would shed his blood at, the, at that place where the fall of man occurred. Amen. Amen. Not on that mountain, but in the skull of Adam. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? In the mind of Adam. Verse 34, they offered him wine mixed with gall to drink, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. They crucified him. They divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him. Above his head, they put the accusation against him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. At the same time, two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. Those he passed by were hurling abuse at him and jeering at him, wagging their heads. And they said to him, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him and acknowledge him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him also began to insult him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders there heard it. They began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Okay, I'll, I'll stop right there for the sake of time. After he died, the rest of that chapter says that graves opened all over the place. And people came out of the graves and were seen walking through the streets of the city. The Roman centurion there at the foot of the cross said, truly, this was the Son of God because of the earthquake that took place and everything that they saw happen there. But I want to I want to just be transparent about one thing here. The way that I used to preach verse 46, I, I touched on this a little bit in our Wednesday night service, but um, the, there's a lot more of you here on Sunday mornings. Uh, I used to believe that at that moment where Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That the father at that moment had turned his back on Jesus. I used to believe that. I used to preach that. And that he couldn't look on sin. All of the sin had been placed on Jesus, so the father had to turn away. When, and that's why Jesus agonizing said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My reasoning was this. That's the first time that Jesus ever called him anything but Father. It, it is. It's the first time. And the last time, I'll tell you. <clears throat> now I'm convinced that I was only part of the truth. I, I want to say this. I do believe this, okay? It's important that you understand this. On the cross at that moment, for the first time, Jesus completely identified with the Adamic lie that took place all the way back in the garden. That we were separated from God. So I believe Jesus at that moment on the cross was fully baptized into the lie that humanity believed that we were separated from God. I believe that. At that moment, there's also something else going on there, but I believe that wholeheartedly because he had to be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses. He had to be tempted in all points as we are. Amen? So the only way he could accomplish that was to know what it felt like to think that I'm not right with God, that I'm separated from God, okay? So in, in Genesis, when you read the story of how they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it does not say that God ran from them. It does not say that God even hid from them. In fact, it says the next day God met them, same time, same place. And he says, Adam, I'm here. Where are you? Amen? Okay, so... God came to meet them, came to talk with them that evening, just like he always did. But the condition of their mind caused them to hide from God. Caused them to hide from God, okay? It was Adam's idea that God had forsaken them or would forsake them and not accept them like they were. But that was a lie. It was a perceived disconnect that took place in their mind. The truth is, God never forsook his creation. He never did. The Heavenly Father never turned his back from us or hid himself from us. He's always been with us. He's always been for us. Amen. He is pro you. He is on your side. He is for you. Amen. So I believe that there were two things happening on the cross when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
uh, forsaken me. The first thing was that he was baptized into that human existence of believing that lie. The second thing is he was he was quoting Psalm chapter 22, which was a psalm from the cross. When you turn over to Psalm chapter 22, he was singing the first line of a psalm. And when you get to that chapter, the first verse says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? It's a psalm of the Messiah hanging on the cross. It's a prophetic psalm. You begin to read down through Psalm chapter 22. By the end of the chapter, by, by verse 24, he says this, For he has not despised, nor abhorred the afflictions of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Amen? Praise God. So he was identifying with the fact that sin had caused us to feel like or to think that we were separated from God. But he was singing a prophetic song that everybody there at the foot of the cross would have heard that. And the Jews would have known it and finished singing the song after he started it. Amen? So it was a powerful thing that was taking place there. Anytime separation is felt, it's always our perception that causes it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, Amen. from the agape of God. Amen. Romans chapter 8 details out nothing, death, life, power, anything, on the earth, in the earth, under the earth, nothing, nobody can separate us from the agape of God. Amen. 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 Now, I, will, I said this the other day. I know that character is developed. And, you know, we, we develop character and that our identity is, tire, is tied directly to maturity, to us maturing to the point where we see ourselves as, as, Christ, as like Christ, okay? But love, he has chose to set that on you. He has chosen to set that. So character is developed. Identity is matured into. We mature into it through our understanding. But love he just chose to set that on us. It's covenant language when he said, I'm choosing to set my love on you. Nobody can take you from it. Nobody can take it from you. I love you because of who I am, not because of who you are. Amen. 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 That's powerful. Last thing I want to share with you, Leviticus 17 and 11 says this. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul." It's an interesting verse because he's prophesying Calvary all the way back in Leviticus. It's, he's prophesying Calvary. Amen? Amen? He says, I've given it to you. I've already shed my blood. All the way back in Leviticus 17 and 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I've shared, I'm have shared. i going to share a few details with you about the blood. I've shared this at Grace Center before, but there are a lot of new folks here in, in the service this morning. When you look up the word shed there, it does not mean that I spilled my blood carelessly. To shed has it means more that he transfused it than it means to share to shed it carelessly. Okay, um, the Bible says, had the enemy known he was the Lord of Glory, he never would have crucified him. Amen. Because when the blood came out, what that did for you and I is it made us sinless in Daddy's sight. Amen. Sinless, we were restored to right standing with God the Father again. Man, our relationship has been restored. Atonement, even the word atonement, when you break it down, means at oneness. So he has brought complete unity into our lives. All of those strands of threefold existence in our lives, spirit, soul, and body, mind, will, and emotions, we can go on and on. He has brought all of those fragmented pieces that were all operating separately and individually, feeling disconnected from God. He brought them back into at one again. Able to think with the mind of Christ to think of ourselves as being right with God. Amen. Because when you think of yourself as being right with God, then you can function like him. <clears throat> the mind, the soul, many people believe, is the mind, the will, and the emotions. But uh, there's one verse in Hebrews 12, 24 that says to Jesus, he talks about everything that we've not come to. We've not come to Mount Sinai again. He, he, he carefully lays that out. We've not come to that place but we have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. But then he goes on in verse 24 to say, we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Amen. That's interesting. 
Amen. That's interesting. The blood of Jesus that speaks greater things than that of Abel. So I asked the question one time, have you ever heard blood speaking before? Have you ever heard it? We would, we would probably think, well, it, it blood can't really speak because it doesn't have a voice. But I want to ask you, when you go to the doctor, they want to find out what's wrong with you. What do they do? They draw your blood. They draw your blood because your blood has traveled to every extremity of your body. It has traveled through every organ. It has traveled all through your body. So they draw your blood for a reason is to listen to what the blood has to say. And they can read the blood and analyze it and tell if you're having kidney failure, you're having heart problems, lung problems. Amen. If there's an infection in the bloodstream, so the blood does speak. It does speak, okay? Um, on a deeper level, they can even use your blood to identify you because blood contains DNA and genetic code in it, okay? 1868, a Swiss doctor discovered DNA, and then in 1944, it was discovered that DNA had genetic properties as well. By 1968, two doctors by the name of Watson and Crick would go on and win the Nobel Prize that year for discovering the structure of DNA and unraveling the mysteries around the molecule, Okay, because of the research, it wouldn't take us long to realize that we could use DNA to find people and track them down from crime scenes, crime scenes where they left any kind of DNA behind. Amen. Amen. You ever watch the cop shows now where they'll give them a glass of water and then when they leave, they pick the glass up and take it to the crime lab to get the DNA off of the rim of the cup, okay? Uh, because they can tell, it, it can tell them things, okay? It can speak to them and tell them things. Um, Jesus, when he told Peter in Matthew 16, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you, Peter. What he's telling him, he said, Peter, you've not identified me by facial recognition, dental records, or a retina scan. Amen. Right? Flesh. <laughs> you've not identified me by running my DNA or genetic code, blood, <laughs> but my Father has revealed it to you. Revelation bypasses all of the normal sequences. Amen. It just comes straight from God's spirit to your spirit. So the blood, you pick this up on any medical website. Guys, you got to just go to uh, Google a medical website and pick this information up. The blood's made up of four components, okay? Red cells, white cells, platelets, and plasma. Four is also an interesting number in Scripture because four is the number of the creator coming into his creation. When you look at scriptures, uh, at numbers of scripture, it means Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then number four, three plus one, creation. Creation was the fourth thing, but the four represents the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming into the creation. Amen. It also represents other things, but what it is a picture of is the Godhead stepping into humanity. Heaven coming to earth, in other words. Four is the number of heaven coming to earth. There are four uh, components that make up the blood. Uh, the red cells stand for revelation. <clears throat> revelation. Each drop of blood contains millions of red cells that are constantly traveling through your body, delivering oxygen and removing waste. And that's what revelation does in our lives. It casts down darkness. Revelation is like fresh oxygen to the body of Christ. And it is to you and I in our lives as well, individually. Uh, red cells contain hemoglobin and iron, which makes them a perfect vehicle for delivering oxygen. Yes. But you know the average life cycle of a red blood cell is 120 days. 120 days. That's why it's important that we always get fresh revelation. Amen. Always get fresh revelation because you can't. I mean, there are denominations that are still preaching the same thing they were 50 years ago and 150 years ago. But revelation, it, it always expands. It unfolds. More we walk in the more light doesn't mean that what we knew back then was wrong. It was just incomplete. We were just seeing and walking and preaching as we had the light at that time. But light continues to expand. It's like walking into a room and your eyes are not adjusted all the way. Yeah. And you see a few things. But then the more your eyes get adjusted, light, what is adjusting your eyes is the entrance of light. Amen. The light is coming in, adjusting your eyes, and all of a sudden you begin to see details you didn't see before. Yeah. That's why I'm preaching stuff now I wasn't three years ago. Yeah. And ten years ago, I might as well throw all those tapes away. Yeah. Because I, I just have seen more stuff now. Okay? Everybody understand that? Yeah. All right. So, number two is white cells. 
The white cells are what helps the body fight infection. Whenever a germ or infection enters the body, a white cell's job is to go attack that and drive it out of the body. White cells stand for authority. People who do not have an understanding of their relationship and the authority that it gives them in life, whenever things go wrong for them, they have trouble processing it. They have trouble thinking it through. They get depressed and they get discouraged. And if that's not treated and ministered to and healed properly, then they slip off into this wanting attention from everything and everyone because of where they're at and what they're going through or what they're dealing with. But when he transfused his blood, we have his authority. Amen? We have the authority. We should take authority over these situations that have been dominating us. Number three, platelets. Platelets represent his power. The human body doesn't handle excessive blood loss well. When you cut yourself, the body tries to protect itself from bleeding out. So when you cut yourself, the platelet's job is to rush to that location and to clot the blood at the source of injury so it doesn't continue to flow out of your body. Amen? Amen. So all the scars you've been crying about, (laughs) all the things that you went through, don't cry about that stuff, amen. Those are just proof that your platelets worked in your life. That what should have killed you, instead you were you're still alive today. Praise God. Because they kicked in, amen. The power of God caused all things to work together for good in you, amen. Man. Hallelujah. Now I'm telling you, I'll tell you this. I've heard Christians talk about the stuff that they went through, and it's one thing to share your past from the point of a testimony. But when you're still crying about things that happened 15 and 20 years ago, you need healing. You need healing. I'm not, this is not me being condemning, but you have got to access healing. If you're bleeding out of wounds that occurred 15 and 20 years ago, first of all, you need a transfusion. You're in trouble. It's no wonder you're anemic. Amen. It's no wonder you're not operating in authority and power in your life and, and getting, getting fresh revelation because you're bleeding out of places that should have healed up a long time ago. Now the problem, or that's not a problem, the solution is this. In this church, I won't just preach that, but we will help you get the healing you need. Because we have ministers that we bring in to help people access healing in situations like that. So I'm not, it's not just a cliche to me. It's not just a, a cute message that makes up part of a series where I say, oh, you need to stop bleeding out and get healed. You know, just get over it. Some people want to get over it. They just don't know how. They really do. They just don't know how. So we bring ministries in that will show you how. Amen? Amen. All right, last of all, plasma. Somebody say confession. Confession. Plasma is the fourth component that makes the blood up. It's not complete without confession. Water. Plasma is basically about 60% water. It's a straw-colored, clear liquid, about 60%, 70% water. And actually, you can look at that and you're... Victory in life is about 60 or 70% what you confess as well. The reason why I say that, because as important as confession is, I know people who have a positive confession, but they don't believe right. They don't believe right. They've got a right, they've got a good confession, and they're confessing things, but they don't believe right. Because they don't believe right, they don't under they don't have current revelation. They don't, they're not operating in power and operating in authority. And authority, so they're just confessing things out that they don't even believe. Man. So the confession's not working for them. But when you get the first three down, the revelation, the power, and the authority, amen, then man. the confession kicks in. Plasma is an essential ingredient because, get this, it is what carries the other ingredients throughout the body. Man. So your confession, it does no good to have his revelation, his power, his authority, if your confession is not carrying it through your body. So when you confess what, what has been revealed to you and you know I'm operating with his authority, I'm operating with his power in my life, I'm operating with fresh revelation that I am a son, amen, that he loves me, that he agapes me and nothing can remove me from his love, then you start confessing and it carries the power and the authority and the revelation through your life, amen? amen. So Abel, if, when he shed his blood, when he shed his blood, or when his blood was uh, carelessly taken, he began to speak. And God said in Genesis, he said, I hear the voice of your brother's blood crying from the ground. And what was it saying? I mean, we, we, we went on to find out 
in by Leviticus what God already obviously knew in, in Genesis that the blood is the life of the flesh. So the blood of Abel was probably crying out something like, I'm the DNA and genetic code of your creation, Abel, son of Adam, son of God. My Abel's body of flesh has been destroyed, so my purpose has been taken from me. And I demand vengeance. That's what his blood was crying out for, vengeance. And God heard his blood and acted on it. And he dealt with Cain accordingly. But Jesus, or the writer of Hebrews says, all the way over in Hebrews 12, 24, the reason he's a mediator of a better covenant now is because if Abel's blood was crying out for vengeance, what do you suppose the blood of Jesus is saying on our behalf? Mercy, grace, forgiveness, not only healing, but divine health. It's powerful. It's powerful what the blood is saying on our behalf. Amen. Hallelujah. So he has never turned from us. He has never forsaken us. He has never at one time not been with us in life. Not everything that you have went through in your life is his will and his plan. I'm telling you. I mean, he's, we say things all the time like God is in control, but I don't believe that. I don't, God is not in control. He left this earth in the hands of man. Okay, so we are the ones that have control here. So when, bad, when we say stuff, we really should think before we just spit that stuff out. Because when we say stuff like God is in control, then the individual who's been raped wonders why did God let me get raped now? It just doesn't make sense for us to say things like that. God has given us dominion of this planet. Our mandate is to call his kingdom into this earth and to demonstrate a kingdom here so that this earth begins to look like heaven. Amen. And we are doing that. The transition is taking place, but in the meanwhile, we still have to overcome evil with good. We still have to fight hate with love. Because there is still a lot of hate in men and women's hearts and a lot of evil intention in people's hearts. And what we've got to do is convince them God the Father loves you. And even though that happened to you, he can heal you. He can heal you and he can demonstrate his love to you and manifest his love to you. Hallelujah. He never turned his back on you. I've asked the worship team to do a special song now to sing it over you. Some of you guys are going to recognize it immediately. But I want you to know that this is how your father feels about you. This is how he feels about you. His covenant. Remember the covenants. I said a while ago, the covenant. That covenant at Sinai was a covenant that he gave to us to show us that we could not get to him without him. Amen? That we needed him. But he always desired to extend grace. The Abrahamic covenant before was a covenant of grace. The covenant he had with David, David got grace, man. I mean, he understood it. He had a revelation. He understood it. The new covenant is a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. And he is going to keep loving you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Should have known by the tone of my voice, maybe, but you did listen. You waited, but you never planned. Instead, you named him in the past, all put up in his hand. 
before I dismiss you today. The first time I heard that song, it's probably in a skating rink when I was a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> but more recently, every time I hear it, I start thinking about God's love for humanity. Amen. This is where I found myself. Every time I hear it, I start thinking that must be how he feels about us. You know, we just lay still in the grass, cold up and hissing, while all he's trying to do is just love on us. And all of the woundings and stuff that we've been through, all the times when we feel like men and women fell short of loving us the way that we wanted to be loved, just causes us to recoil and not understand his love for us. But I'm telling you, he will love you like no man can ever love you. He will love you like no woman can ever love you. Amen. It's an agape love. It's a God kind of love. He loves you that way because of who he is, not because of who you are. Amen? And you say, well, Pastor Mark, does that mean I never have to stop making mistakes? What you need to stop doing is focusing on the mistakes. And you need to focus on what God has done for you and what he has done in you. Because you're not going to be transformed by looking at everything you do right and wrong. But when you see what he did for you and how much he loves you, that will begin to change you from the inside out. When you get a revelation of his love for you. So, Father, we thank you this morning for your love for us, your great love wherewith you loved us. We thank you that the Bible says that you loved us so much that you lavished your love on us. You bestowed it on us by calling us the sons of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for that. And Father, this morning we just relish it, and we revel in it, and we receive it. And I just want to challenge you today. If you've never really received his love, his unconditional love, just lift your hands toward heaven right now and just say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive your love for me. I thank you for your love for me, your great love for me. And I thank you that it's transforming me and it's changing me, Father. Hallelujah. And I'm becoming a better person because of how you love me. Because of how you love me. Hallelujah. And I thank you and I praise you. And I praise you, Father. I just even declare that in the coming days of this week and in the coming weeks and in the coming months, as we begin to think on your love for us, that we are going to walk completely out of addictions that we've been fighting, addictions we've been struggling with, wrong thinking, wrong mindsets, things that have gripped us tightly for years in some cases, is simply going to fall off. It's going to lose its hold. It's going to let go as we're gripped by your love for us. I thank you, Father God, and I thank you also that you're going to teach us to love how you love. You're going to teach us how to overcome evil with good, how to overcome hate with love. Hallelujah. I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.